Welcome back to my channel, and as always, thanks to my subscribers. Today I am working on this tank car. I couldn't find a manufacturer's name anywhere, but my first impression is good. All of the stirrup steps are intact, the handrails and ladders are present, and the brake wheel is still present. Looking closer, I can see that the brake stand has actually been cast as part of the tank. Also, the ladders are not true to scale. The side rails and rungs are about 9 inches wide, as you can see. Finally, for some reason, a total of five pressure safety valves have been cast into the tank body, three on the dome and one on each end. Perhaps this is a requirement for a tank car in liquid chlorine service, but tank cars in general service only require two. For this project, I plan to remove the cast-on brake stand from the car body. I will also remove three of the five cast-on vent valves, two at the ends of the car and one on the dome. I will replace the cast-on hand grabs on the tank ends with wire grab irons, and I will replace the cast-on grabs on the dome as well. I will add wire grabs to the ends of the underframe. I will also replace the ladders with photo etched ladders, and I will attempt to fashion a new handrail that looks as though it runs completely around the car. Of course, I will replace the trucks and couplers, and I will repaint the car and apply new decals. Most important, since the underbody details are most visible on tank cars, I will add detailed air brake piping and mechanical brake rod details. So follow along with me, and I will show you how to turn this tank car into this one, with a little time, some simple tools, and some inexpensive materials. I start by popping off and discarding the truck and coupler assemblies. Next, I gently pry the tank away from the underframe. If I'm lucky, these connections are just snap fit. But they're not. One of the pins has come out of the underframe intact, but the other has broken off. I'll have to repair that later. Now I pry the handrails out of their mounting holes. If you want to reuse the handrails, be gentle and try not to bend them as you remove them. They can be straightened, but the repair will be pretty obvious. If you do bend the handrails, don't panic. I'll show you how to replace these later. Finally, I gently pry the two tank sections apart. Once again, I am hoping for snap fit connections. And this time I get lucky. The pins remain intact, so it will be easy to snap the tank body back together when it's time to reassemble. With the tank sections apart, it is easy to remove the brake wheel. As always, I start work on the underframe first. I am always amazed to see how many molding imperfections are left on these inexpensive cars. It just takes a few minutes to slice off excess plastic which remains attached to the underframe. Then I smooth any rough spots with a sanding stick. Next, I cut away the cast-on stirrup steps. Even though all four stirrup steps are intact, replacing them is quite easy, and the replacement steps look a whole lot better than the original cast-on steps. A pair of sprue cutters snip the cast-on parts away. Then I smooth the remaining casting with my number 17 blade and sanding sticks. Once I have cut away the steps, I can see that the walkway surrounding the underframe has notches where the steps used to be. I need to fill in these notches before I can replace the stirrup steps. I cut small pieces of styrene to fit and glue them into place. Then I use my number 17 blade and sanding sticks to remove any excess material. Next, I need to fabricate new attachments to hold the tank assembly to the underframe. I start by cutting off the good pin, then I will glue it into its hole to provide an anchor for the tank screws. I want the glue to cure thoroughly before I drill the screw holes, so I'll do some more work on the underframe before the next step, which is drilling a pilot hole using a number 65 drill bit. This allows me to ensure the hole is centered on the mounting pad. Next, I drill a 1 16th inch hole following the pilot hole. This will be the guide for the hole drilled in the underside of the tank. Next, I carefully line the underframe on top of the underside of the tank. When I have the parts positioned to the best of my ability, 
I drill a 1 16th inch hole in the tank underside. I have two 1 half inch long self-tapping wood screws, which will fit these holes nicely. Finally, I drill a 1 8 inch hole through the underframe. This hole is large enough to allow the screws to turn freely. Don't make the mistake I made. I decided to countersink the screw heads. This was a mistake for two reasons. First, it is easy to make the countersink hole too deep. This will cause the tip of the screw to touch the body weight and prevent proper tightening of the tank body. And second, the countersink hole is large enough that the drill wants to tear the plastic instead of drilling the hole. Next, I install new bolsters and kingpins for the replacement trucks, and I drill mounting holes for the coupler gill boxes. See my still breathing video for more details. The model comes with the complete set of brake system components, the air reservoir, the AB valve, and the brake cylinder. But since these components are more visible in tank cars than in any other car, except perhaps hoppers, I decided to model most of the brake piping and mechanism as well. Here are the brake components I'll be using. This mechanical linkage assembly from the brake cylinder through the truck brake rods by AccuRail, an AB valve from the Tichy AB brake set, and the air reservoir from the Tichy AB brake set. My first step is to remove the cast on brake parts and install some structural supports for the new brake components. I've used a piece of scrap styrene to make a new cross rib, and I've used a short length of styrene channel to make the brake cylinder support. The new cross rib is placed so the air reservoir just fits between the cross ribs. I have also drilled holes through the center sill. I will install the train line, fashioned from 20 thousandths wire, on either side of the center sill. I've also drilled holes in the cross ribs to allow the train line to pass through them. This is much more easily done before the underframe is assembled, but since I'm starting with the completed casting, I just have to make do. There is a 45 degree angle in the train line where it crosses through the center sill and another one on the other side. I bend one end of the train line by eyeball then test fit it into the underframe and trim the other end to length. Once I've done this on both sides, the illusion of a single train line passing through the center sill is quite good. I'll glue it in place with some super glue before I proceed. Next, I use a number 77 drill to carefully drill some holes in the brake components. The air reservoir gets two holes, one into the service reservoir and one into the emergency reservoir. The AB valve gets four holes, true from the air reservoir one from the train line, and one to the brake cylinder. Now I cement the AB valve and the air reservoir in place. I cut a length of 12 and a half thousandths wire to fit, and I glue one end into the AB valve, and I carefully solder the other end to the train line. Use a tiny dab of flux at the joint, pick up a small blob of solder on your hot iron, and carefully touch the solder to the joint. Before I attach any more of the brake system, I drill holes for the hand grabs on the car ends, and I drill holes for the stirrup steps. I don't want to take the chance of damaging any delicate brake details while drilling these holes and installing the hand grabs. Installing the hand grabs is pretty simple. Drill the holes, trim the ends of the grabs if necessary, apply a tiny dab of super glue, and insert the grab. I use a scrap of 30 thousandths styrene as a jig to get the grab clearance uniform. 30 thousandths of an inch is about two and a half scale inches. Once the hand grabs are dry, I install the rest of the brake system piping. This is a simple matter of cutting and bending wire to fit, then gluing the wires into the pre-drilled holes in the brake components. Once the piping between the air reservoir and the AB valve is in place, it's time to mount the mechanical brake assembly. This assembly has two mounting pins, one on the brake cylinder and one on the floating brake lever. I drilled a hole in the center sill under the floating brake lever, then adjusted the assembly to locate the hole under the brake cylinder. Once that hole was drilled, I glued the entire assembly in place. 
With the brake cylinder secure, I was able to install the airline between the AB valve and the brake cylinder. Next, I glued the stirrup steps in place. Since these steps are not symmetrical, be sure to glue them in the correct orientation. The last item to fix on the underframe was the brake stand. I cut a new brake stand from 3 16 inch styrene channel, and I tapered the top ends of the flanges, as you can see here. I glued the brake wheel in place and glued the assembly to the B end of the underframe. Next I turned my attention to the upper tank body. First, I used my number 17 blade to remove many of the cast on details. Before I pick up any sharp knife, I ask myself two questions. First, do I want to spend three hours in the emergency room getting my hand stitched up today? And second, how am I going to keep this from happening? The construction industry calls this exercise a job safety analysis and it is well worth the two minutes it takes. I ended up slicing off the four hand grabs on the car ends, the two hand grabs on the dome, the cast on brake stand, and three of the five pressure safety valves. Once I had sliced them off with my knife, I used sanding sticks and some 1200 grit sandpaper to smooth the tank body. I replaced the original ladders with photo etched brass ladders from Seaport Model Works. You can see that these ladders are almost the same width as the original ladders, but they are much closer to being dimensionally correct. I drilled holes in the tank car body just underneath the cast on dome platform. I used a number 72 drill bit for this. I will trim the ladders to length and form the angle when I install the ladders during final assembly. I decided to replace the original handrails. They were used to hold the ladders in place so they did not run the full length of the car. Also, they were 25 thousandths diameter, which is about 2 and an eighth scale inches. Handrails should be between 1 and a quarter and 1 and a half inches in diameter. I'm using 20 thousandths inch wire. This is still a little too large, but there is a trade-off between scale fidelity and durability. To provide the illusion that the handrails are continuous, I used just one of the cast-on railing mounts on each side. I filled the other hole with styrene rod and I removed the cast-on raised edge around both holes. I checked to make sure that two pieces of wire would fit into the holes. Bending new handrails is straightforward. Just take your time and plan each new bend carefully. Remember that wire does not bend to perfect right angles. There will always be a small inside radius, so plan your bends to account for that. Notice that I have left about half an inch of wire sticking into the car body at one end. This long end will allow me to hold the handrail securely while I paint it. Once the handrails have been fabricated and removed for painting, it's time to drill holes for the body hand grabs. To get the grabs as level as possible, I wrapped masking tape around the circumference of the car just below the handrail mounts. This gave me a reference line. I drilled the top hand grab holes 3 millimeters below the top edge of the tape. Before drilling the lower hand grab holes, you'll need to bend each hand grab into a curve. Use your needle nose pliers and make very slight bends along the width of the grab. Hold it up to the edge of the tank to see if your curve looks okay and adjust as needed. Once the hand grab has been formed, clip a short amount of wire from the lower end. This allows you to insert the grab in the upper mounting hole and see where to drill the lower hole. It can be difficult drilling a hole which is not perpendicular to a curved surface. If you have trouble, start the hole perpendicular, then adjust the angle of the drill after a few turns of the drill. Once both holes have been drilled, insert the grab to the proper depth and secure with super glue. You might have to trim the upper mount to fit in the hole you drilled. You absolutely must trim the lower mount so it does not protrude into the interior of the tank casting. This would interfere with the fit between the upper and lower tank pieces. Use the same procedure to install the dome hand grabs, but remember to bend the grabs so they follow the curve of the dome. Now it's time to paint. I painted the completed underbody assembly separately. 
Then I painted the lower portion of the tank, then the upper portion of the tank, and finally the handrails and ladders. When painting the upper tank body, I use this holder. It lets me paint the entire piece at the same time. It adjusts to old box cars and other car types as well. I'm using the Mid-Continent Petroleum Tank Car Decal Set from K4 Decals. K4 Decals might just become my favorite decal supplier. Their decals are offered in any of nine different scales, including three different G-scale proportions. Most HO sets include enough decals to letter at least four cars, and they ship orders free in the U.S. with no minimum purchase. One of their competitors won't even sell direct unless your order totals more than $20. One detail you'll find, only on very high-end models, is the addition of the car road number on the center sill. These numbers are often included with tank car detail sets. The car builder's insignia is often found at the other end of the center sill. There is one more trick I'd like to show you. Here is a paint blemish on the tank body. Rather than sand and repaint, I'm going to repair this with a special decal. Circus City Decals makes paint patch decals in a variety of colors. I'm using the black patches to cover the blemish in the paint job, but you can also use these to cover reporting marks and other car data before applying the desired data. It doesn't really matter if you get a perfect color match. Railroads were constantly painting over outdated data before stenciling on the correct data, and they often didn't bother to get a perfect paint match. Once the decals are complete and sealed with dull coat, it's time to assemble the car. I added weights to meet NMRA standards and then snapped the tank portions together. Then I attached the tank to the underframe using my self-tapping screws. I tapped the mounting holes for the couplers and trucks and installed the couplers and trucks and I checked the coupler height. I ended up adding about 15 thousandths of an inch of shim under the coupler gearboxes to lower the couplers to the correct height. With the car assembled, it was time to bend the ladders, trim them to fit, and insert them into the holes on the underframe and the car body. Photo etched brass ladders are easy to work with, but they have very sharp edges, which should be filed smooth to allow the paint to adhere better. And here is the completed car. I have included links to all the items mentioned in this video in the comments below. As always, I would love to hear your comments and questions. If you want to see more videos of this type, be sure to subscribe and hit that like button. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.